If you don't know who I am, my name is Adam, and I get to be one of the pastors here at the church, and I always love any chance they get me to stand uh, in front of you guys and yell a little bit and press into the gospel and share a little bit of life. And uh, I grew up with a mom who was, uh, she, she loved the arts, big arts fan, and, and as a mother does, she exposed me to those arts very early, and it had a massive impact on my life. Now, we gotta be very clear here. When I talk about the arts, I'm clearly talking about Star Wars. All right, any Star Wars fans in the house? Come on, that's okay, yeah, yeah, we can celebrate that. Listen, now, now Star Wars has been through a lot over the years, but the purists, the purists will tell you there is only one Star Wars, and that's the original trilogy. Right, we're talking about episode four, five, and six. Come on, all right? And so, uh, you know, we can argue which one's the best, but the truth is, there is nothing like episode five. The Empire Strikes Back is the pivotal moment in the series, and uh, there's lots of reasons for it. And so, uh, let's just do a little recap of episode five. If you haven't seen it yet, spoiler alert, but it's been 40 years, that's on you. All right, that's on you. Uh, And so we pick up episode five with our heroes returning. We got Luke Skywalker, we got Princess Leia, we got Han Solo and Chewbacca, and they are fighting with the Rebel Alliance against the evil empire, who is led by arguably the best villain in cinematic history, Darth Vader. And so at the beginning of the film, they're fighting on the ice planet Hoth and just narrowly escape defeat. And Luke and Leia go separate directions. So Luke heads off to find Yoda. Now we're not talking about cute 2020 baby Yoda. All right, we're talking about creepy 1970 animatronic Yoda, but that was the best they got. So he's going to find Yoda, going to do that Jedi training. And then Leia and Han and Chewie are going to go try to fight the Empire. And so the whole movie is their journey as heroes struggling to culminate at the finale, at the end of the movie in Cloud City, right? We know we're in Cloud City and it's a trap. Darth Vader set them up. And so we got Han and we got Leia and we got Chewbacca and they're enjoying a nice dinner and the door's open and there's Darth Vader. Han's like, what? Gets the blaster out, pow, pow, pow. Darth Vader's not having it. Boom, 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 using the force. And something weird starts to happen. I think I like the bad guy. I I think I'm falling in love with Darth Vader. There's something happening to me. I need to repent here. What is going on? I'm loving the bad guy. And so Luke, he feels the disturbance in the force and he gets on the X-Wing and he heads straight to Cloud City and the movie uh, comes to this final battle of good versus evil, this incredible lightsaber fight that leads to a sky bridge and Darth, Darth Vader just gangster style just knocks off Luke's hand into the unknown. And then there's the moment, right? Vader looks at Luke and says, Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. And Luke says, he said, you killed him. And then Vader drops the line. It's it's the moment. He says, no, I am your father. What? Like that is daytime talk show moment at its finest. Like there's the reveal. You are the father. And like we just lose our minds. And what's the hero of the story do? No. (laughs) And you're like, Darth, kill this fool. Like, that's when I went Empire, right there. I just was straight Vader fan. If this is how our hero's gonna react, just kill him. And so Luke escapes, Leia picks him up in the Millennium Falcon, and they fly off, and the movie ends. It is 124 minutes of the good guys just getting the trash kicked out of them. Now, the reason why I share that story is that it's gonna be the first 15 to 20 minutes of today's talk, all right? I just wanna set the tone early. We're gonna be rough in the first 20 minutes here, and we gotta be. Now, I promise, stick with me, okay? The back end of this thing is gonna be full of a lot of grace, a lot of mercy, and a lot of hope. But listen, in order for good news to be good, it's gotta invade bad spaces, and we gotta talk about some bad things. So with that, let's jump in. This is Will Smith, and he's a... (laughs) And he's about to receive an Academy Award for Best Actor. The Academy Awards are the most prestigious night in the film industry. It's where all the leading experts are gonna come together and we're gonna celebrate a year worth of film and we're gonna give out some awards. It's this tiny little gold man called the Oscar and Will Smith is gonna receive Best Actor. It is the culmination of a lifetime of his work. But when tonight is over, Nobody's talking about Will walking away with the Oscar. They're gonna talk about what happens between him and this guy. That's Chris Rock. Chris is an actor and a comedian, and tonight he's a presenter. He's about to give an Oscar for best documentary, but before, Chris is gonna crack some jokes. And so he takes some shots at some celebrities in the audience, but one of the shots he takes is at Will's wife. 
See, Will suffers from, Will's wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, suffers from a condition that causes hair loss. So Will, so Chris does what Chris does. He cracks the joke. Now, as far as comedians and jokes and celebrities go, it's, it's pretty mild. The crowd likes it. But what happens next? It's gonna set the internet on fire. Will Smith is gonna get up out of his seat and in front of a thousand people in the auditorium, in front of millions of people watching around the world, Will Smith's gonna walk up to Chris Rock and he's gonna slap him right across the face. Now, Chris takes it like a champ, he really does. And then he, he throws a joke out to kind of ease the mood and everybody laughs and we're all buying into the bit. But here's the problem, this isn't a bit. That slap is real. And we know it's real because in just a couple seconds from his seat, Will is going to quiet the entire auditorium when he screams at Chris and says this, keep my wife's name out of your mouth. Now, he didn't exactly say that. Uh, there was a word <laughs> that he, he, uh, he said, and I'm gonna admit it because if I say that word from this stage, then I don't get to talk from the stage anymore. And so just to be clear that he's serious, he will scream these words to, Will, to Chris one more time. And over the next 24 hours, over 100 million people are gonna view this clip. And I was one of them that next morning. I could not believe what I was seeing. I gotta be honest, it made me feel uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable for people in the audience. I was really uncomfortable for Chris, but who I was really uncomfortable for the most was Will. That this night, this incredible night for him to, to achieve this incredible moment would be shadowed by this decision that he makes. And so the reason why I'm bringing up that story is because if we're reading this gospel right, this incredible story of God's love from Genesis to Revelation, of God's redemptive work in broken sinners, if we're reading this right, there should be a lot of things that stir up inside of us. There should be hope, there should be mercy, there should be grace. But one of the things that should happen when we read the Gospels that we don't like to press into is this thing called conviction. That if I'm actually reading this the right way, if I'm actually stepping into the Gospel and living this out in my life, this Gospel should, at certain levels, on a regular basis, make me feel uncomfortable. It should press me, it should challenge me, it should disturb me, it should do some things inside of me that are very, very uncomfortable. And we need that. We need at moments in our life and in our faith to be shaken up from the norm. And so Paul gives us a hand in this and in Philippians chapter three, he speaks into this moment. And so in his church, in his letter to the uh, young church in Philippi, this is what Paul says. But whatever gain I had, whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And I think what Paul is trying to get us to understand is this, is there are very few things in your life that actually matter that are worth your energy and your time and your best. There's very few and very few of us actually find it. But there's a lot of things in our lives that aren't worth anything. They don't deserve our time. They don't deserve our energy. They don't deserve our effort. And we're drowning in it. And Paul would call those things rubbish. Now, that is a, a funny word. Like, like it, it's just, it seems innocent. It's like a childish word. But it's the best word that we have for the context of this letter. Because make no mistake, Paul is using foul language. This is strong wording. Historians and theologians have come together to agree that what Paul's talking about when he says rubbish, he's talking about garbage. He's talking about filth. He is saying a word that if I'm a reader and I'm looking at what Paul's saying, when I come across that word, it's gonna feel shocking to me because Paul is not holding back. He is standing up out of his seat. He is walking onto the stage and he is slapping across the face the idea of what it means to follow Jesus Christ that a lot of us have bought into and are frustrated with. And that's the entire context of this next set of statements that Paul is gonna to read to us. Because when it comes to this gospel, there is a way to hear it and to be dramatically changed by its truth, so much so that your life is never the same. But there's also a way to see this gospel and to hear it 
and to claim to know Jesus and to claim to be his, but your life has absolutely no proof and no evidence that that is actually real. And if you read through this scripture long enough, what you're gonna find is a consistent teaching that goes against that kind of faith. And so we find it in some different places. We find it in Matthew chapter seven, Matthew 25, James two, 2 Timothy three. And I don't got time this morning to unpack all these things, but you do your own research and you press into these truths and you're gonna find that theme play out. And so I think it's important before we start to move on that we need to establish what I'm talking about and what I'm not talking about. I am not talking about struggle because when you choose to give your life to Christ, And when you choose to live for him and put him first and press into his truth and live out this faith in a dark world, you are going to struggle. You're gonna go through stuff. You're gonna take shots. You're gonna take some frustration and some struggles from this world. You are gonna constantly be confronted with the sin in your life and then go through this cycle of, Being confronted, laying it down, moving forward. Being confronted, laying it down, moving forward. You are gonna struggle. Struggle is the birthright of what it means to follow Christ. So I'm not talking about you pursuing Christ with all you have, but also you're in a season right now where you're just kind of getting beat up. That's not what I'm talking about today. That's not what Paul's talking about. What I'm talking about is those of us in this room and online who would claim to know Christ, claim to be changed by him, but there is absolutely no evidence in your life that that's actually true. And there is no desire inside of you to pursue him, to follow after him, or surrender to him. That's what we're talking about today, and that is what Paul is trying to get stirred in us when he talks about this difference between choosing to pursue Christ and choosing to pursue rubbish and garbage in your life. And I don't think it's a stretch Today. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna step aside from the scripture, all right? Because this is me talking, not, not the scriptures. But I don't believe it's stretch. For someone like Paul who bled for the church, for the early believers who built the church through sacrifice and loss, for anybody who has fought for the gospel and anybody from Stephen to present day who has actually given their life for the gospel, I don't believe it's a stretch for any one of them to look at any one of us who would claim to know Christ, but yet live a lifestyle that doesn't help the gospel grow, but actually destroys the witness of the gospel. I don't believe it's a stretch for someone like Paul to look at people like us, that that's the way we would choose to live and would say these words. Keep my Savior's name out of your mouth. Because I actually live this thing. To give your life to Christ, to put him foremost above all things, gonna be the most amazing, most incredible thing, and it's gonna be the hardest thing you're ever gonna do with your life, to actually live this truth. And then to go and be a light in a dark world, to fight for the heart of the people that you share with and that you love, to present the gospel to people who are in brokenness and darkness, that's gonna be equally as challenging. And you know what's frustrating? Frustrating trying to live out this truth, trying to be a light in the dark world, trying to show people that Jesus is enough and Jesus is worth it. And we gotta deal with people who are claiming to follow Christ but don't care about Jesus at all. Somewhere along the line, church just became this game, this hobby, this thing. And instead of the life building up the church, it's destroying the church to which I don't believe it's a stretch for Paul to say, you know what, if that's where you are, then just keep my Savior's name out of your mouth because it's actually doing more damage than it is doing good. In the 90s, there was this author, his name was Brennan Manning, and here's the statement he had about atheism, and I think it's so sobering. He says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle, and that is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Now, I don't know if he's completely right, but I don't think he's completely wrong, and I think somewhere in the middle of this, the church is going to have to own some of this mess. There are way too many people outside the grace of Jesus Christ that see people inside the grace of Jesus Christ and they know more about what we're against than what we're for. And that we're riding and dying on political platforms over the gospel. And our social media feeds are full of it. 
We got this weird self-righteous thing thinking we're fighting the right fight and we're, we're sticking it to people and we're missing the whole point of, of what this, why this matters. I told you it was gonna be rough the first 15 minutes, all right? I told I promise, I gave you the Star Wars story, okay? But I'm, 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 I'm honestly, I'm actually going light. There's this moment in Revelation where John is writing to the churches and he gives, he's giving each of them a different prophetic message and to one church he says something that's pretty, that's pretty hard to hear. He's not just talking to this particular church but I believe he's talking to every single one of us who would choose to live our faith in this way. In Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter three, verse 15, he says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, I wish you were cold or hot. I wish you could just make a decision on what you're gonna do with your life. I wish you could pick a side. But because you're neither cold or hot, because you're lukewarm, you're in this weird middle place, I spit you out of my mouth. Now that is way worse than keep my Savior's name out of your mouth. That there is this truth that Revelation 3 is pressing into us, that at a certain level, there is an appreciation for the extremes. That on one side, you'd be like, Jesus doesn't just have my heart, man. I'm not just speaking lip service, but look at the way that I live my life. James would say, you tell me you have faith, great, but I'm gonna show you I got faith by what I do. And we got people saying, man, I'm trying to live for Christ. I'm laying everything on the line. I'm pursuing, I'm fighting, I'm struggling, which I would say, brother, sister, go, run, get it. And I love that side of the room. But what the gospel is saying is there is even an appreciation for some honesty on the other side of the room for the person that says, I want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. I'm not gonna fake it and I'm not gonna pursue it. But you would be hot or cold, but there's this weird space that the American church has been living in for such a long time where we're like, I'm all about that Jesus life, but yet my life is no reflection of the gospel, no reflection of change, in which I claim to know Christ with my mouth, but I don't live Christ with my life. And the question is, what are you doing? What is this? This weird church game that we play where we think that we're actually walking through this. And, and, and believe it or not, this morning, I'm not trying to make anybody in this room feel bad. I'm not. Because that's not going to do anything for us today. I'm not interested in making anybody in this room feel bad. What I am trying to do is I'm trying to open up this truth and allow the gospel to read us and to reveal inside of us some things that we just need to be honest about. And in doing so, it maybe actually could set us free today because to live here, I don't get what this is. This isn't what it means to follow Christ. This is a version of Christianity that, that has been sold and given to people that doesn't make any sense. I don't know what it is. And you live here long enough, you're gonna punt on your faith. And so... There's some truth that we need to talk about in the room. There's some things we gotta say, some tough things we gotta say, and we gotta say it out of love. So I'm gonna say some things that I'm not, I'm, not, I'm talking to me today. Listen, if anything, I'm preaching to me. Maybe you just get to be a part of listening in on it, but I think you're probably there too. Here's the truth. You're a problem. I'm a problem. We are a problem. We are. And we don't like to talk about that because we get really good at hiding it. We get really good at burying ourselves in systems to fix what's wrong with us. But at the end of the day, the truth is waiting for us at night when we go to bed. And it's staring us in the face in the morning when we're brushing our teeth. And in that commute to work or soccer practice, it's the voice in the back of our head saying, something's not right. And Paul, I think, tries to open just a little window of this in Romans chapter seven, when Paul says this, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Am I reading anybody's mail today? Is this not the abusive cycle that we get caught up in? That there are things in my life that I wish I was doing, but I can't seem to get there. And there's a lot of things in my life 
that I am doing that I wish I wasn't doing and I can't get it to stop. And so it's just easy at first to bury that with relationships and hobbies and even church. But the reality remains the same, that there is a way that Jesus has called us to pursue him. And somewhere along the lines, we bought into the lie that it was here. But we gotta own that this morning. And I'm gonna get into uh, a little bit why we gotta own it. But before we get there, we gotta, we gotta understand that When God calls us out and the discipline of the Father is not to shame us, but to set us free. I don't know what your attempt is to fix what's wrong with you, but at best, it's petty. God is not interested in our petty attempts to cover up what he already knows is wrong. And let's just be real, we're bad at it anyway. Like, we're so bad at being religious, aren't we? Like, like, listen, we're good at this. This is easy. Like showing up, dressing up, and I dressed up for you today, right? Like well, I put a jacket on, okay? I just put a jacket on, but like this isn't what Adam wears around the house. I got four kids, one's five. We don't get the good jacket out there, but we get the good jacket at church, and we're real good at this. This is just, what's happening here? We're so bad at this. And, and this isn't really an honest view of us. Now, for some of us, it is. Some of us, we've got it. Like, we, we're understanding what's happening, and you're listening to me, and you're like, come on, man, preach it, preach it, preach it, because you know what I'm fighting against right now. But some of us, we get it. But, but for the most of us, this isn't the real thing. But I can tell you what's real for, for almost all of us, probably 90 to 99% of the room. I know where the real you exists, exists right here. This is you. How broken is it that our search history says more about us than our salvation? That if I really want to know who you are, give me access to your phone. Let me see the snaps and the apps and the photos and the conversations and what you pursue and what you look at and what you scroll through at night. You and I are only what we are in the dark. All the rest is reputation. We are only what we are in the dark. Here's what I mean about it. When I talk about the dark, I'm talking about when there's nobody else but you and God. That is who you actually are. That is what God sees when he sees us. And we like to play this game where we like to try to hide that and, 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 and we like to try to dress it up and make it look good. But what we're talking about here is the imaginations of our mind, the desires of our heart, the actions of our body. We are what we really are when nobody else is looking. That's who we are. And you play that game long enough. When all of that comes out of you and exposes you, or when it's not enough, that's when we bail on God. And you might be hearing about this, that ain't me, man. Not you? Well, let me ask this question. If God took it from you tomorrow, would you be okay? It, what's it? I don't know, what, what is it for you? What's the one thing that God's not allowed to touch? I'll pursue you, I'll follow you, I'll be faithful to you. You can have everything in my life, but you can't have this. What's the one thing that if God touches it, then you're out? Chances are that might actually be your idol. That might actually be what you worship. And you gotta be real careful because if there is something that's untouchable, there's a good chance that you might have found identity in it. And if you're not careful, you will become what you worship and it would just bleed out of you. And the reason why I'm pressing so hard today and the reason why we're about to get back into the text and hear what Paul's trying to say is because today's message isn't just about setting you free because at first and foremost, at a minimal level, that's what it's about. That there are some of us today that we have bought into this lie and we are following into a false idea of what it means to know Jesus and it is exhausting and it is breaking us. And we're about this close to quitting. That's, that's not at all the purpose of what Jesus came. 
And he wants to set us free from that. But it's not just about you today. It's about the people that you share life with. That you are the Jesus that people are going to see and experience. Now listen, if the world hates you because of Jesus, well listen, that's just another Monday. Because that's the truth, right? That as you live this thing out and you press into this truth, you're gonna get opposition. People are gonna question you. And they should. One of our guys on floor one uh, says this a lot and we just overuse it, is that you should live the kind of life that demands questioning. But for the world to hate Jesus because of you, that's a problem. And Paul's attacking this idea. And so I want today to be uncomfortable. It has to be. It has to hurt a little bit because without pain, nothing changes. And until the pain of staying the same where you are becomes greater than changing, until the pain of staying the same becomes greater than changing, nothing's gonna happen in your life. And let's be real, something's gotta happen. Something has got to happen. Now listen, I'm not talking to everybody today and I get that, but I'm talking to somebody. And you are frustrated with where your life has been. You are frustrated with the way that you have been pursuing Jesus. You have been frustrated with what it means to walk with Jesus. And I'm gonna agree with you, something has to change and that's you. We gotta get real honest with ourselves in this space and, and, and what what we are not looking for today, don't get me wrong, because it's real easy to get caught up in a talk like this and, and, and to get emotional and to start to feel bad, to feel guilty and to want to change because you feel guilty. Listen, God is not interested in your guilt. This isn't about feeling guilty. Guilt is cheap. It is so cheap. It's emotional. Like, yeah, you can feel some things and, and, and that's actually not guilt. What I'm believing and hoping is that's the Holy Spirit convicting you today and saying, hey, maybe some things got to change because if it's just guilt, you're gonna feel it for about... 15 to 20 minutes the moment you walk out this door, but once lunch comes and gets in that belly and you take that Sunday nap, you're gonna wake up feeling better and all of it goes away. God is not interested in guilt today because guilt is cheap. What God is interested in is changing your life. That's the point of the gospel, that Jesus showed up to actually change us, to set us free from ourselves and to set us free into something else because let me tell you something about repentance. Repentance does not happen when you feel sorry. That is not repentance. Repentance happens when you change. When your life is going one direction and the gospel of Jesus Christ smacks you in the face and says, hey, I didn't make you to live like this. There's something better for you. And in that moment, your life drastically changes and you're not living for you anymore. You're living for something else that's better and stronger. You're not living in this weird middle space, but you're hanging out over here that's what we're talking about today. And for Paul, the culmination of this truth happens uh, on the road to Damascus. He's heading to Damascus and he's heading to, to, to persecute and destroy the church. That, that's Paul's testimony. That's his early story. I love the fact that the scriptures are full of a bunch of just messed up, jacked up people. This allows me and you to never use our past and our faults as an excuse that God can't do something with us. Listen, no, nobody here out sin and Paul. What'd you do this week? Probably some things that weren't, uh, that you're not proud of, but the good chances are none of y'all busted in a church. Threw some people worshiping Jesus in jail and maybe killed a couple of those brothers, but that's Paul's story. And he's on the road to Damascus to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. And in that moment, Jesus literally slaps him across the face and he says, Paul, you ain't doing this no more. This is not the life I have for you. And oh, that we would be so lucky for God to do that for us that the love and mercy and grace of the Father would discipline us. God talks about this all the time in the scriptures. A good, loving parent disciplines because they love. Listen, Myers family, we live over here uh, on the big yellow house on the corner. There's a lot of traffic going around there. And I got, I got a five-year-old that likes to run. She's a sprinter. Now my kid bolts towards the main road where there are semi-trucks and cars going 45 to 50 miles an hour, what do I do? I walk over to her and just scoop her up real easy. Now, hey, probably not a good idea. Maybe, 
maybe, maybe let's not run so fast towards the road. Maybe let's, no, I'm gonna run in front of her. I'm gonna stop her. I'm gonna get on my knees. I'm gonna scream, stop, what are you doing? You can't go into the road. And she's gonna cry and she's gonna get upset and she's not gonna like me in that moment, but I have to do that for her because a good parent puts discipline into the child because they love them. And that's what God's trying to do for us today. He's not trying to make you feel bad. He's trying to set you free. We can't trust ourselves. We're a problem. And the issue with religion and the issue with systems is that and you start pressing into this truth. And God starts pressing into some things in your life that you're not comfortable with him touching and you start to just bail on Jesus because it's like, and I, I see this all the time. I've been doing this for a long time. I don't know how many people I've had conversations with and say, hey man, where you at in your faith? Oh yeah, about that, yeah. Kind of just took a step away from it. Jesus just doesn't work for me. Nah, man, you just ain't working with Jesus. Because somewhere along the line, he started pressing into some things in your life that aren't good and aren't healthy and aren't well for you and you didn't like that, so you bailed. Now listen, I'm not... Listen, build a family, pursue healthy relationships, be financially stable, eat broccoli, do yoga, and work out. Pursue those things, but I'm telling you right now, all those things are one phone call away from being gone forever. But not Jesus. That's the point. Is that Paul's trying to bring us into something that is, is, is profound, So Paul says this. We're gonna go to Philippians 3. He says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straying towards what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he says, and let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything, you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. I love the fact that Paul says this because this is real. Paul's hard to read. Brother just plays at a different level than all of us. He's starting varsity and I'm not even sitting on the JV bench and I can read Paul and get frustrated with where I am in my life. Like we go back, right, to uh, Philippians 3, verse 3, uh, verse 7, Philippians 3, 7, and it says this. Paul goes, whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake. So Paul has realized that there is a way to live your life, that there are things that are good. They're not good for you. Uh, the writer of Hebrews shares this passage. We shared this at camp with our students and it, it was, he calls us to run the race with perseverance, to run this race with perseverance and to set aside the sin that easily entangles and the things in our life that easily entangles. Now, the writer is talking about two different kinds of things. He said that there are sin that tangles you and there are other things that tangle you that trip you up and stop you. Now, when we read that verse and we do this, we do this in our life, we just think about the sin. To look at your life and the way that you follow Jesus and the way that you live for him and to ask the question, what should I not do? That is the cheapest question you could ever ask. What should I not do? I wanna live for Jesus I wanna be his, what can I not do? What's, what's, what sins can I not do? Is, is this sin okay? Is, is this okay? Is, what about this? And you gotta be real careful when you start playing that game because it's real easy to justify things. But the author says it's not just about sin. Stop asking, is it wrong? Because it's not just sin. The writer in Hebrews says that there are other things that tangle us, meaning this, there are things in your life right now that aren't bad but they're not good for you. So what's the question I should ask when it comes to my faith? What are you trying to say? The question you should ask is, is this thing wrong in my life? Is this thing okay in my life? Stop asking that question. What should I ask? Ask this, does it help me run? Do the things in my life help me run towards Jesus? Does it help me live for Jesus? Because if it doesn't, I don't want it. Which means to follow Christ might mean for some of us that we're gonna have to say no to some things that we love and like 
for the sake of the gospel. And Paul says that I count those things as loss so that I may what? May attain Christ. Paul's, Paul's saying it. I don't, I don't know what your salvation story is. I don't know what you were saying yes to when you said yes to this thing, but if it wasn't yes to Jesus, you said yes to the wrong thing. I'm gonna say that again. I don't know what you said yes to. But if it wasn't yes to getting Jesus, you said yes to the wrong thing. Because that's the point. That's what we get. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, we're gonna start closing this thing out. Here's what Paul says. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The Paul is saying that there is something that gets me up. There is something that motivates me in moving. It is not the promise of a better life. It is not the promise that I'm gonna be healed from my sicknesses and diseases. It's not the promise that my kids are gonna grow up and be okay and be fine. It's not the promise that the finances are gonna be okay. That might be your story, but that might not be your story, but that's not the point. And somewhere along the line, we lost that. And when life didn't go our way, we bailed on our faith and it didn't just hurt us, but it hurt everybody that was around us watching the way we were living our life too. And Paul says, here's what compels me. It's the love of Christ that I get Jesus. And this is why this matters. Pastor Mike just spent an entire series talking about momentum, talking about united weekly worship, talking about these life-changing relationships, talking about surrendered living. The point of all of this is to get to what Paul's about to say. This is the point. This is why we exist, why God has put us where he's put us. And here's what Paul's about to say. Uh, let's go ahead and pick it up uh, in verse 18. It says, and all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. What is the message of reconciliation? It's this. It is this all out shout that no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, you can come home. That you get Jesus. Come home. And I love what he says as he closes out this thought. He says, we're Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus didn't save you because you're awesome. He saved you so that you would make much of his name with the life that you live. And the point of following Jesus and saying yes to him is not that everything works out. It's that he works out in all the things that are happening in our life. And in that moment, my life does not become about me anymore, but my life becomes about him. And I become an ambassador to compel people to be reconciled to the God of the universe somewhere along the lines, we forgot that we get Jesus. We get Jesus. I, I think it's crazy because we're in church so long that we say his name so much that it just becomes white noise, that you and I get Jesus. And Paul, in Philippians 3, he goes back and he said, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. And it's okay that if you're not there yet this morning, not that I've already obtained this, but one thing I do, I press on. I press on to make it my own. I press in to Jesus. And at the very end of that verse, in Philippians chapter three, Paul says this, let us hold true to what we have attained. We get Jesus. It's crazy. And he's enough. I don't know what this year is gonna hold for everybody in this room. It's impossible. 
that you and I were one phone call away from something that we're holding on to very dearly being gone. But the promise we have in the gospel is that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. When Jesus shows up, it changes everything. The only way this is gonna work is you're gonna have to let him love you. You're gonna have to let God love you. We do this weird thing in church where we think if somehow God knew all the things, that he'd take it back. If God knew you were gonna be messy. God knows that your heart is drawn towards sin. That's the point of the cross. The cross is a picture of how much he loves you, of what he was willing to do to save you. It is a picture of the grand scope of his love that he loves you. And in light of that, Paul says, I counted all his loss. What? Everything. Anything that doesn't get me closer to him, it's loss. Why? So that I would know him. So that I would know him. So how do you let God love you? You're gonna have to let go of whatever you're holding on to. I'll say that again. You're gonna have to let go to whatever you're holding on to. I'm talking about the dirty stuff, the stuff in the dark that you have let define you and cling to you for so many years. You gotta let that go and you gotta let him love you. And I'm also talking about the good stuff. From the outside looking in, there is nothing wrong with that being a part of your life. But let's be real, because it's in your life, stopping you from following it. And you gotta let that go. So we're gonna do something a little different here. I'm gonna ask you to stand. I'm gonna stand if you wouldn't mind from your seat. I, uh, a couple years ago, God just kind of started changing my heart when it came to, to worship. And I stopped listening to the radio and I started listening to more on Spotify. And I, I just, I couldn't stop listening to worship songs. I think what's so powerful about worship is that worship songs will say some things out loud that we didn't know we needed to say until we said them. And so my favorite uh, worship song is How He Loves. And here in a moment, we're going to sing it. We're going to declare that over our lives and we're going we're to speak that truth because I think there are a lot of us today that need to be reminded that there is a God that loves you, loves you. Opening lines of the song go like this. And he is jealous for me. Do you realize the God of this universe wants to spend time with you? How crazy is that? He longs to be with you. When you wake up in the morning, there he is. In your highest highs and your lowest lows, he's right there. And in the middle of our mess, we get caught in scrolling through our phones and trying to be distracted in our life. And the God of the universe is saying, look up, I'm here. I want you. I want to change you. The God of the universe wants to have a relationship with you and it says that his love is like a hurricane and we are like a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. And if you would just let the God of the universe roll over you, what's gonna happen is he will not destroy you, but he will cause you to make a choice. You can either hold on to whatever that is or you can hold on to the storm that is him and let him take you. Some of y'all today need to let go. You need to let go and you need to hold on to the God of the universe that is trying to move you. And he says that when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, that there is a way to pursue Jesus, that the problems in your life are not gonna go away, but they are going to be insignificant in comparison to him. And then I realized just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And we are his portion and he is our prize. Oh, church, if anything today, could we not be reminded that we get Jesus, that he's the prize, he's the point? He's the point. You get the God of the universe in a real relationship with you. That's what you get. Crazy. 
We are drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. And if his grace is an ocean, we are all sinking. And heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss. In my heart, it turns violently inside of my chest. And my favorite line in the song, and I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way that he loves us. You got a story? Guess what? Everybody else does too. You've been through some stuff? Yep. You in a season right now that's broken and muddy and dirty? Yeah. You know who doesn't care? God. And if you would just let him love you, stop wasting your time dwelling in the past and in the brokenness and let him embrace you because I don't know about you, I don't know how much time I got left on this earth, but I don't want to spend it living in regret. I want to spend it chasing after the God of the universe and telling every single person that I can that there's a better way and there's hope and there's change and there's life in a man named Jesus Christ. That's the way I want to spend the rest of my life. So I'm talking to two people today. You're in this room and you have given Christ your life, but there is no evidence that he is there. Something's got to change now. Let's stop playing this game. Come on, stop playing this game. You are too valuable to the king of kings. The influence you have on the people in your life matters too much. So let's let's make some changes now. But when we take this entire message and we, 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 we close up with this last thought, here's what we know. Given everything that Paul has said, Do you know what the response of heaven is to us? It is not keep my Savior's name out of your mouth. No, no, no. The response of heaven in light of what we have read today is this, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you're here today, maybe this is the first time you've heard the gospel, that there is a God that loves you despite you, and that no matter what you've done, it doesn't change the way that he feels about you. Or maybe this is the 100th time you've heard it. I'm inviting you to accept it today. And here's how that works. That right now in your moment, you and I awkwardly looking at each other, that you would do this, that you would confess and you would say in your heart that you would maybe even speak it out loud if that's what you feel comfortable with today. And you would say, God, I am a sinner and I am broken. And I believe that you lived, you died and you walked out of that tomb. Forgive me and save me. I call your name in that moment. Like a father wraps his arms around us. He loves us. God, we thank you so much for this moment that we can be in. God, we thank you for this truth. God, we thank you for the life changing reality that you love us. And that today we would step in it. We'd actually believe it. We'd let it change us. That we wouldn't settle for lukewarm faith, but we would press into you. We're not there yet, but we are gonna get there because we're gonna hold on to what we've obtained, and that is the love that we have through your sacrifice, Jesus. And as we sing these words, we declare this truth to you. In your name, amen.